everyone. I'm going to be doing this tutorial via voiceover today, uh, mainly because there's a lot of steps involved with splicing hemp, and I wanted to show off more of the doing rather than explaining, so I'm going to do the voiceover for that. First thing you'll need are a couple of containers, uh, circular ones I find to be the best. So I've got one here filled with water and then I have two that are dry. And then I've got this hemp fiber that I got um, online. And I've just unraveled this main bit and pulled off a small amount to work with. Now, let's talk really briefly about um, why I've decided to use hemp for splicing. Essentially, last summer I was listening to a talk about must farm and splicing, and I had some beautiful flax that had already been redded and was ready for draft spinning, but I had this hemp that looked like it was suitable for splicing, even though the materials from Must Farm are made from flax and not hemp or nettle in that case, I thought, well, these are transferable skills. And so I thought maybe I'll just try working with hemp to see if it can be spliced, which, you know, good assumption because yes, it can be. So what I've done here is I've pulled off a small bit from the small hank that I pulled out and I'm splitting it long ways. Now I've got the bowl of water here because I found through experimenting last summer with small bits of hemp that it works really, really well wet and it makes a very smooth yarn. Um, you do need moisture at the joining spot. So what I've done here is taken the first strip and I've wetted the whole piece, first one half and the other, and I'm laying it into the bowl. I'm taking the next piece now, which is roughly the same diameter and those fluffy bits at the end, I'm going to be joining this end to end. So I'm wetting that part and I've grabbed the first end and I'm holding them overlapped a little bit at the end and I'm going to be rotating away from me a couple times just to make a secure join there. And now I have two pieces that have been sort of spliced together end to end and I am now um, wetting the second half of the second piece that I've used. And so um, essentially you just move from strip to strip, wetting it, twisting the ends, and then moving on to the next piece. So this is a method of making yarn that does not necessarily require the use of a spindle. As you can see here, I'm just using it through manual methods, just end to end, giving it a twist, and then uh, laying the whole piece into that uh, container next to me. Now, the container isn't really necessary, but it's super convenient for containing the coil, and if you're producing a lot of this and you need to move things around, then you have a nice handy bowl for it. Um, you could also wind this onto a stick, um, but because I wanted to do a small sample, the bowl worked just fine. The great thing about splicing is it's very easy to maintain the gauge of your yarn because you're taking bits and pulling them apart and splicing them end to end. So that's it. There's no drafting. The size of gauge is dictated by how large a piece you pull apart from the main bundle. So if you want a thinner gauge yarn, you use a smaller piece. If you want a thicker gauge yarn, you use a bigger bundle. 
uh, but the same principle pr applies regardless if you were doing a thin yarn or a thick yarn, you still want to um, twist at the ends. So that's basically what I've been doing here is keeping in mind a particular gauge that I'm going for and when I split off the piece I'm going to then splice onto the next piece, I'm trying to maintain that particular gauge. Occasionally, you get a piece that is uh, not quite large enough as a bundle, so what I've done is I will keep that set to the side, and when I'm pulling out the next bit, I can actually make a little bundle. Now, the reason why I wanted to use the hemp, in addition to the fact that it was a um, bigger bundle, <laughs> than my flax bundles was 250 grams, was the bit that you see there that I'm pulling apart, they didn't hackle it as finely as they did the flax, which meant I could actually separate it with my thumb and finger um, a little bit easier so that I could have a lot of control over the diameter of the yarn. So that was another reason why I specifically chose hemp for this particular project. You probably could do this with flax, but you'd have to use it at a stage when it hadn't been hackled finely. Now, for those of you who grow your own flax and go through the bedding process uh, manually, I think you could definitely um, apply this splicing principle to that flax. But if it's been finely hackled, it's going to be much, much more difficult to splice. Not impossible, but you'll have very, very thin yarns uh, as a result. So obviously it would take a very long time to uh, make a significant amount of yarn if it's extremely, extremely thin. I've now switched to a more first-person view so that you can see a little bit more what it's like to um, work with this hemp like this. I think the hemp is probably about two feet long and I'm only overlapping about three inches of it at the ends and that is the only part that's getting twisted here. The rest of it just gets coiled into the little pot there. So there's no twist throughout the majority of the length and it's literally only at the end where I'm adding in the new piece where there's twist. You would think that the twist wouldn't hold super well at this point, but the water really helps hold the twist in place. And here's a close-up of that twisting action. And the wetness just helps keep those flyaway ends down during this process. And once it starts to dry, it will hold in place. So during the plying stage, um, there's not going to be any issues with it unraveling or anything.
Lost Farm is a late Bronze Age site in Cambridgeshire and part of the reason why I was using this site um, as my point of reference is because I studied Iron Age Britain which temporally Lost Farm is dated to around 850 BC and the Iron Age in Britain starts around 800 BC so if you're thinking about textile production, a lot of these methods will overlap between periods because these periods are defined more through a convenience to study and analyze rather than everything just completely changes at once. So my thinking is that at my principal sites during the Iron Age, it's quite possible that people were using this style of making yarn in addition to spinning yarn that you can see through the presence of spindle whorls. I've got a thicker yarn here. So this is just to show you how easy it is to modulate the thickness of your yarn by just having a bigger bundle during the splicing. And I'm also showing you an alternate method for adding twist at that join point. So I'm using my knee here and I'm just overlapping the ends as I was doing before. But instead of doing a couple of twists forward with my fingers, I'm going to do a roll with that against my knee. It's because there's more space on my leg than there is between my two fingers. It's the exact same process, it's a little faster, but it does also mean that you're going to have a wet knee while you're doing this. Um, probably better while the weather's nice, less so during the winter. Um, but I thought this would also give you an alternate uh, approach in case you do open air museum type stuff and want to demonstrate what splicing is. You have a couple of different methods that I've used that I've also seen in ethnographic accounts of people splicing yarn doing both the finger twisting method and also rolling it over the knee or the thigh. In the American Southwest, um, there are spinners that have used this particular method of thigh spinning and it's one of those points of contention among um, early yarns uh, because it doesn't really leave an archaeological imprint. There's very little information that we could possibly retrieve people performing this way of making yarn. Now it's really great for these vast fibers, although you can do it with wool. It, um, it's usually um, applied with a cedar yarn, so it's wool and cedar together, plant and a, a sheep's wool um, yarn. But this is actually really convenient if you've got two of these balls of yarn that you're making at the same time, where you can both add in the new splice and then ply it together with a sister yarn held um, below the knee, you can actually produce a workable yarn very, very quickly. This first sample I'm going to show you, I'm going to use this supported spindle. And I've put on there a half hitch loop. And this is the two strands of yarn that I've made. And I'm just plying them together. I'm not using any water to do the ply. And so this is an example of using both thigh spinning for the splicing and uh, spindle spinning for the ply in order to produce a yarn. This isn't necessarily any time period being depicted here, just showing ways that it could be done because if we have the evidence of spindles, it doesn't always mean that they were used in one specific way in the archaeological record. So in this case, I'm using a supported spindle to achieve the result of plying.
Here I have another sample with a top roll spindle and I'm going to be using a wet method to apply these two pieces together, making a little half hitch loop for the hook. And again, rotating to form the ply. You can do this with the spindle in the hand, like I'm doing here. Also, you can use it as a suspended spindle, so you can have that dangling from space, plying your yarn. Either way would work. Especially if you are new to this type of spinning, I would recommend having um, a spray bottle of water handy. I find that was very useful to keep these little bowls of splice yarn wet enough where I didn't have to constantly dip my fingers into the water. That's part of the reason why I moved that little cup of water out of the way. And if you are new to this way of making yarn, um, it may be more convenient to use a, a top roll spindle, um, but you could also use a hooked spindle, which is basically uh, a stick with a hook at one end that just serves to stop the yarn from pulling off as you are adding twist. So the whirl in this case isn't expressly necessary, but if you wanted to switch between suspended spindling or in the hand twisting like I'm doing, then it's really easy to do that. Another wonderful thing about this type of yarn is it looks like it is a single until you get to that spliced join and then you realize that this is a spliced yarn rather than a direct spun yarn. The wet spinning produces a wonderful smooth yarn, like you can see here. It's a little bit shiny because it's wet. That's just a bit of the stem that I pulled off. This spot here is where I did the splice join, so it looks like it's extra twisted and it's a little bit um, stiffer. <laughs> now this is what I did with the dry plying. And as you can see, it's much fuzzier. You know, it's fine uh, if you're going to use it for making bags or mats or, you know, some other kind of project. But if you're weaving with this, it can actually cause um, issues during the weaving process. When you're all 
done. What I've done here is I've taken a PVC pipe nitty knotty that I made years ago. I think it's a yard and a half. Rather than twisting, I am just going around the edges like this so that it's all skinned up. I'm moving very delicately because this yarn is very wet still and I don't want to put unnecessary tension onto the yarn. I just want enough so that it wraps around snugly and so that I don't accidentally pull this yarn apart. One of the things about fast fibers is they are incredibly strong while dry and incredibly weak while wet. And if you've watched my video on community questions regarding flax spinning wet or dry and furthermore weaving wet or dry, there's some responses that may be of interest uh, regarding that point. But nonetheless, I am working gently so that I don't accidentally rip my yarn apart because it absolutely will. Here's the finished yarn that I spliced. It's very limp at the moment because it isn't completely dry. But once it dries, it will be uh, good to use. I also wanted to include this little bonus video where you can use hemp to make cordage. So here I've just doubled over a length of fiber and started this twisting process, which is very simple. This is um, twisting up and away, and then switching the top to the bottom and pinching that twist into place. Twisting, flipping, twisting, and then flipping. It's very easy to make a piece of cord like this, and part of the reason why I am including this in this video is because my loom weights that I investigated as part of my doctorate, they have signs of suspension wear, which means a cord, or a piece of yarn, or whatever you want to call it, likely went through those perforations and then suspended uh, the total weight um, this also was witnessed in the chalk weights and the clay weights that I investigated. So if you want to use a yarn, you could, but you could also use cordage, which is what I'm doing here. Very simple. You can do this with redded yarns or non-redded yarns. And if you are starting to run out of some fiber, all you do is take a new length, fold it roughly in half, um, and then to put the middle there at the cross and twist in the fibers. If you've watched Sally Pointer's video on making cordage, I'm basically using the same principle, but I would imagine that cordage is much stronger for holding up the heavy weights I investigated as part of my doctorate. So my weights tend to be around 1,500 to 2,500 grams each. So a simple yarn may not hold very well under that kind of tension and also during transport and continued usage. So it's quite possible that Iron Age people in Britain used a cord kind of like this to use um, as a segue between the loom weight itself and the warp. Mm -hmm. 